Hi there, welcome back to AP Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug and it's time for another lesson about periodic table properties. Now, if you'll recall back to lesson four, if you're a faithful watcher of this channel, then you know that you've seen this graphic before that's on the screen here about how electrons affect the properties of individual atoms. And so we know that there are two uh, main factors at play here. We have effective nuclear charge and we have electron distance. And this is the trend that we have here when we're looking at those on the periodic table. So let's take a look at how this affects atomic radius. And when I say atomic radius, I'm talking about something like, uh, like this here. We have an atom, and there's the nucleus right here. And you know the average distance between uh, the nucleus and the electron cloud, or the outermost uh, part of the electron cloud, is the atomic radius. So if we use these, these trends that we see here, we can predict if an atom is going to be larger or smaller than another one. So let's try this example here. We have magnesium compared with, with uh, uh, barium. Hopefully you realize that since there's a greater electron distance from the nucleus to the uh, outermost part of that electron cloud, barium is going to be larger than magnesium. So we can generally say that the farther down you go on the periodic table, you're going to have a larger atomic radius. And likewise, the farther up you go on the periodic table, you know, like magnesium, these toward the top of the table are smaller. Now, what if we compare these two atoms? We have potassium and we have krypton. Well, the trend is, as we go to the left, the atoms are larger, as we can see down here. As we go to the right, the atoms are smaller. Now, that's a trend. That doesn't explain the trend, right? So don't put that down as your explanation. The explanation has to do with effective nuclear charge. You know, both of these atoms have the same number of occupied energy levels, have four occupied energy levels. But krypton has 36 protons almost twice as many as potassium has. So that greater effective nuclear charge is able to pull those energy levels in much more tightly, making krypton a much smaller atom. I'm kind of fond of saying that in chemistry, we don't talk about protons very much. We talk about electrons quite a bit. But the main job that protons have is to keep the electrons from flying away. So if that's the case, then krypton is doing a really good job. It has lots of protons, so it can really pull those those electrons in much more tightly. So that's why krypton is smaller. Now let's take a look at this graphically. This is a, just a graphical representation of the atomic radii of most of the representative elements. And this is measured in uh, picometers. So as you can see, the trend is pretty much what we expected. With very few exceptions, the atoms on the left side and on the bottom of the periodic table are the largest. And as we go toward the right, and especially toward the top right, the atoms are much smaller. And if we think about why that is, you know, as you go down, we have more occupied energy levels, so there's, there's that greater electron distance from the valence electrons to the, to the nucleus. And as we go to the right, we have greater effective nuclear charge, more protons to pull in those energy levels more tightly. So let's take a typical question here that we might see on an AP exam or on a general chemistry exam. It says, use atomic structure to explain why the atomic radius of lithium is larger than the atomic radius of fluorine. So if we're looking at the periodic table, we know that lithium and fluorine are both in the same period of the periodic table. They both have two occupied energy levels. So what's the deal here? Why is lithium larger? Well, here's the answer. You know, they both have two occupied energy levels. However, since fluorine has more protons than lithium, and it's a lot more, like three times more, fluorine has a greater effective nuclear charge. You know, more protons to pull in those energy levels. Therefore, fluorine will have a greater force of attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud, making its atomic radius smaller than that of lithium. And so we talk about greater force of attraction you know, in the AP curriculum, uh, they like to use this uh, $10 word here, Coulombic attractions 
that's the same thing as far as we're talking about here, force of attraction. So Coulombic attractions, force of attraction, that's basically the same thing when we're talking about these opposite charges. Here's another question that we could ask here or answer. Use atomic structure to explain why the atomic radius of iodine is larger than the atomic radius of chlorine. So if we look at these on the periodic table, we can see that they're both halogens. Iodine is uh, farther down on the periodic table than chlorine. Uh, you know, chlorine has fewer occupied energy levels. So here's the reason. The valence electrons of iodine are in the fifth occupied energy level, while the valence electrons for chlorine are in only the third occupied energy level. Therefore, the distance from the outermost electrons to the nucleus is greater for iodine than for chlorine. So we have some answers there. We can talk about um, the electron distance. We're talking about oh, uh, oh, we're talking about comparing atoms in different uh, uh, periods of the periodic table, but in the same in the same family. Let's take a look at another concept that's similar, but it is a little bit different, a little bit more more complex here, and that's the idea of of ionic radius. Now, if we take an atom and it gains electrons, well, it's going to become a negatively charged anion, as I'm sure you've learned in your first year chemistry course. So here's a, uh, a rule for that. Anions are always larger than the atoms from which they are derived. So if we look at that in a graphical way here, here's an atom of fluorine, not drawn to scale, of course has you know the nine protons, the nine electrons, but once we toss in another electron here, and it now has, you know, it first of all started out at 57 picometers, well we toss in that electron, it now has 10 electrons, and guess what, it's much larger. In fact, it's more than twice as big as you can see here. So what's going on here? Why is it that much larger? We've only added one electron. Well, once again, it can't be um, so necessarily because of the, the protons, you know, they have the same number of protons. It has to do with the electrons. It has to do with the electron-electron repulsions. We know that electrons are always trying to repel each other. They're trying to get away from each other. And so fluoride, F negative, has more electrons than a fluorine atom, while they have the same number of protons. So the explanation here has to do with the electron, or the greater, I should say, electron-electron repulsions in fluoride. And that's what allows those electrons to spread out farther from the nucleus. And so that's what you want to say if, you, if you're comparing uh, a fluoride ion or any other uh, nonmetallic anion to the uh, atom from which it is derived. Now, let's take a look at the other side of this coin here. We, we've taken a look at anions, but if we look at cations, you know, atoms that lose electrons, they become positively charged cations. And cations are always smaller than the atoms from which they are derived. So let's take a look at the case of sodium here. Sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons, and they're arranged in three different energy levels. If we take a look at the size there, it's about 166 picometers. Well, if we pull that outermost electron away, all of a sudden it now becomes a sodium cation, and it, has, it still has those 11 protons, but it has only 10 electrons. And look how much smaller it is. It's, you know, a, a, it's shrunk down to much, much smaller than it was before. Well, why is that the case? Well, I bet you can take a look at this graphic and understand why. Notice that we've lost, I mean, sodium in its cation form here has lost an entire occupied energy level. You know, sodium has more electrons over here and more energy levels than the sodium cation, while they have the same number of protons. And so we can say that the sodium ion had its outermost electron in the third occupied energy level, while sodium, the sodium atom, has its outermost electrons in the second occupied energy level. So we can see that we've lost an entire occupied energy level, 
and you know that makes it smaller. Now here's another thing to think about. If it helps, think of this as kind of a tug of war. We know that the job of the protons is, is to keep the electrons from flying away. And if we look at this here, we can say that there are the same number of protons. They have 11 protons in both of these. But, you know, we have 11 electrons, but only 10 electrons in this one. So the protons are winning. It's their job to pull those energy levels in. So they're pulling them in much more tightly, and the, 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 uh, the resulting ion is a lot smaller. Over here, in this example, they're the same, and so neither one is really winning, and so, you know, that atom is much larger. Let's take a look at a trend. And if we look at the atomic radius of uh, the representative elements, in fact, I should call this ionic radius. Let me correct that up here. We have the ionic radius of representative elements in picometers. We can see that the trend is, is similar. As we go down the periodic table, we have you know more occupied energy levels, and so the, the ionic radius gets larger, as we can see. As we go to the right, we are losing more and more electrons. You know, like in the case of the rubidium ion, we've only lost one electron. Down here, antimony has lost five, and so it you know it, it's much much smaller. There are more protons and electrons by quite a bit by five evidently. So these sizes are getting much, much smaller. Now, it's a similar trend if we look at just the anions. You know, to the right we get smaller, down we get larger for pretty much the same reason. Of course, if you compare anions and cations, well, you'll find, you know, it gets smaller and then it jumps up quite a bit and then it gets smaller again. So we have that trend for ionic radius as we look at these different ions. Now, let's compare a couple of things here. Let, let's compare the two ions that we talked about here in our earlier examples. Let's compare the sodium ion and the fluoride cation. And we notice that they both have the same number of electrons. They both have 10 electrons. We can count them there. We can look at them from the way they're configured. And so whenever we have different species like this that have the same number of electrons and the same electron configuration, we say that those two are isoelectronic. You know, sodium started out with this ground state, this normal electron configuration. It lost an electron. Fluoride started out like this. It, you know, gained one. So they have the same electron configurations. So in chemistry, we say that these two ions or these two species are isoelectronic with each other you know, the same electron configurations. So, if they're isoelectronic, my question is, why is the sodium ion over here much smaller than the fluoride anion? You know, uh, it can't be so much because of the electrons, because they have the same number of electrons. The electron, electron repulsion is the same. Well, what's the only other option? It has to be the protons. It's that nuclear charge there in the middle, those protons. If we look here, sodium has 11 protons, fluoride has nine protons. And so once again, it's back to that old case of tug of war. The job of the protons is to pull those electrons in, to keep them from flying away. And in this first example with sodium, looks like the protons are winning. And so the protons are able to pull those energy levels in much more tightly, making the sodium cation very small. Whereas in the fluoride example, the electrons are winning, and they're trying to get as far away from, as they can from the nucleus. And so here the electrons are winning, so it makes that anion much larger. And so you know that's a case to compare here. If they're isoelectronic, you have to compare protons. Now, with what we've learned here in this lesson, let's take a look at some examples, some questions that you might see on homework or quizzes or tests. Here's the first question. Which of the following species is not isoelectronic with krypton? 
Well, the periodic table will help us here. We know that selenium normally has 34 protons by looking at the table there, but that negative two means that it's gained two electrons, so that's 36. Now, krypton normally has 36 electrons, so it looks like selenium, or the selenide ion, is isoelectronic with krypton. Potassium, on the other hand, normally has 19 electrons, and it's positive one here, so that means it's lost an electron, which is 18. So that's not the same as 36. So I'm gonna say that it is potassium, and that is correct. Now, just to make sure here, let's just check with the others here. Strontium has, I believe, 38 electrons, and the two positive means it's lost two, so yeah, we're down to 36. And bromide, well, bromine normally has 35 electrons, but that negative means it's gained one. So yeah, 36. So choices A, C, and D all are isoelectronic with krypton, having 36 electrons. That potassium anion, or cation rather, is not isoelectronic with krypton. Now, let's rank these four species in order from smallest to largest in size. Now once again, the rule of thumb here is that we have to realize that since they have the same number of protons, they all have nine protons, it all comes down to the electrons, that electron-electron repulsion. The one that has uh, the fewest electrons is going to be the, the smallest, and the one that has the most electrons is going to be the largest. And so if we're ranking from smallest to largest, we need to find that ha the one that has the fewest electrons first. So that would be the most positively charged. So that's the F plus. The F plus is the most positively charged, so it's the smallest. And then the one that's next in order of charge is the neutral fluorine atom. And then after that is the fluoride negative one atom. And then the one that's largest is the one that's most negatively charged. So that's the fluoride negative two ion. So that's the order in which they're going to be ranked. Let's try one more example together here. Let's arrange these ions in order of increasing size. Now notice that I've kind of thrown a little curveball at you here. Notice that we don't have the same element this time. Uh, you'll notice if you start looking at, at, at these electrons on the periodic table, where these are, all four of these species are actually isoelectronic with each other. They have the same number of electrons. They all have 18 electrons, if you start uh, looking at these. They're isoelectronic with the noble gas argon. So if it's not electrons, it has to come down to protons. The one that's uh, smallest is the one that's going to have the most protons. And the one that's uh, the largest is going to have to be the one that has uh, the fewest protons. And so if we're going in increasing size here, we want the smallest one first, so that whichever one has the most protons, so I believe that would be uh, calcium here, has the most protons with 20, and then uh, potassium has 19 protons, so that one's next, and then uh, 17 protons is next, that's chlorine, and then 16 protons, the one that has the fewest protons, is going to be the largest. It's, it's not going to be able to keep those uh, energy levels in as tightly. So sulfide is going to be the, the largest one here. So we've taken a look at several examples of how this works. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've learned something about periodic table properties and, um, and about atomic radius and ionic radius and isoelectronic species. If you've learned something, if you'd please smash that thumbs up button, that would be really appreciated. Thanks for joining me on my AP Chemistry and General Chemistry channel. My name is Jeremy Krug and hope you join me again in the future where we can learn some more chemistry.